Help us, Lord. Miles Wiley Albright. Uh, October 23rd, 2023. Bible in a bar. Cobb Island Pit Stop. Um, Huntsville, Alabama. USA. Earth. As far as location. Lord, we love you and we bless you. We want to be alert and obedient to you at all times. Teach us, Lord, tonight. Show us all your counsel. Open the word of God to us, we pray, and make us all teachers. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, this morning, I began to seek the Lord about what to share tonight, and I was actually over in Proverbs, I think, and I was turning over, you know, how you, I got a thick Bible, and I was going to turn over to look at something in Genesis I had in mind, and halfway over there, the Bible opened up to the death of Samson, and I felt compelled to stop there, and... <clears throat> pray and read and study and pray and read and study. And so, um, like I said last night, it was a quote I read recently, what the Lord is to you will be what the Lord is to others through you. And I want to try to show you how I study, how I read the word, how I listen. There's something called a word study, and that's... Uh, that's uh, something that a lot of people are familiar with, but some people aren't. And really, a true word study needs to be a study of a word in Hebrew or Greek, depending if you're Old or New Testament. Because if you do a, a word study of an English word, it's obviously uh, arbitrary. Translations are arbitrary. And sometimes you can you can find some neat stuff by looking up you know, the word, say, thorns. And, uh, but, you know, if you just look for under the word thorns in your concordance, or if you, even if you get an exhaustive concordance, sometimes that same Hebrew word, if you're in the Old Testament, might be translated briars over here, and so you'll miss one. So there, we all have a lot of tools, more than anybody ever has in history. But there's exhaustive concordances that'll take you to the a list of, all the Hebrew particular, the location of all the particular Hebrew words in the Old Testament or Greek and the New. And you can lean heavily on that because it's it's not leaky. If you're, if you're just going to study the English words, say like the English word thorn, you know, that can be really good, but you can really lean heavily if you're actually looking at all say all of the hebrew words or greek because the original manuscripts are perfect they're absolutely perfect and it it seems like a, if you have never done this before this may seem a little challenging but it's really not once you get used to the concept of doing this um and tonight we're going to look at uh the word sahak and and again, Hebrew, you know, it's got this 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 H sound here. It's kind of a, if you've been listening to the news much lately, uh, you, you hear them talking about Hamas, but they don't. Most time, if they're Israeli, they'll say Hamas or Hamas. You know that kaha kind of a kaha sound, whereas we have th is th and s is sh, and all our consonant blends like tr tr. Uh, they're normal to us, THR, thr, like three. But ha <laughs> ha is a little un unusual. And that's not terribly important, but so this is this is the word for uh laughing sometimes, or mocking or frolicking. Sometimes it can actually imply sexual intimacy, a frolicking in in intimacy with a 
man and a woman. But it also, the most basic meaning is laughter. Uh, and I, and I don't mean to give you a lecture here on Hebrew because I'm so crude in my knowledge of Hebrew and Greek. Um, the S sound can be a SH sound like sh, or a S sound like sh, like C or shad. Um, and it give, it's a little hard sometimes to translate that out. You may remember in the in the time of Jephthah. Uh, there were certain tribes that pronounced shibboleth with a sh, and some pronounced it sibboleth with a s sound, and so they killed everybody that pronounced it wrong. At the, these these in, in this war, they killed everybody that put an sh where they're supposed to just be an s. So, uh, but there's a little difference in the meaning sometimes between the the s sound with a sh or a s is a. That's the next, the third, 21st letter of the Hebrew alphabet is this S thing, and it's shaped like a W kind of. And it's actually the first letter of Shaddai, as in El Shaddai. Um, and so the the high priest would bless bless the people. He would say the ironic blessing. He'd say, Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. Yahweh turn his face towards you and, and give you peace. And he was saying Yahweh into their ears three times, but he would also hold out his hand and hold up the, the letter, the sheen for the first letter for Shaddai. So he's putting Shaddai in the eye and Yahweh in their ear. Okay. And Leonard Nimoy, who was the actor that played Spock, who was Jewish, he was the one that suggested live long and prosper. You know, that's where that comes from is that, Hebrew tradition, you know, it's actually supposed to be like this, but he would I think he kind of did it like this. Anyway, uh, that was that was a consolid a great consolidation of the erotic blessing. Uh, so anyway, uh, this shahak word is special, and it, it caught my heart this morning, and it is the, really the heart of the word for Isaac. We say Isaac like. I Z I K I Z I K in English, but if, if you'll know, a Hebrew person will say Yitzchak, Yitzchak, and there's it's actually sort of three syllables. The second and third syllable here is kind of run together, but it's it's it is uh, he laughs or he's named for laughter because both his parents were laughing at the thought of being able to conceive at age eighty nine and ninety nine, and so they sahak both of them. And so, and, and even the Lord Jesus there in a pre-incarnate Christ form, after he has lunch with them, you know, he's talking about the, they're going to conceive. And to, several times the word Zahak is used there when uh, the Lord says, why did, why did uh, uh, Sarah Zahak? And she says, I didn't Zahak. Yeah, you did Zahak. So it, it goes back and forth. There's about six times that word is used there in about two verses and, Genesis 18. So Sahak is kind of a underscored word. Uh, that was chapter 18. Uh, the Lord appears to uh, Abraham, and that's when he changes his name from Abram to Abraham. In chapter 17, the previous chapter, his, his wife's not there. And he tells him, you know, your heir is not going to be Ishmael. It's going to be a child from Sarah's body. And it says he fell down. I mean, you'd be afraid that an 89-year-old might be injured themselves. If a person is 89, you know, that's kind of that's kind of special, we think, around here. Um, he might have injured himself falling down, but he apparently didn't, but he fell down laughing. And so um, the Sahak thing, the first time it's used, with this S-H pronunciation, it's, it's used, Shahak is used 13 times in the Old Testament. Begins with Abraham falling down laughing, and the last time is re relevant to Samson. Now, for some of you, you may remember the Lord's shown us this connection between Abraham and Samson uh, several years ago. And um, I forget the name of, you could look it up on, on YouTube, 
under my channel, uh, it's probably something about the Treaty of Beersheba. But we're going to work up to that tonight and look at several shahaks and see this connection between what Abraham does and what happened to um, what happened to Samson. Uh, to kind of give you a quick summary of where we're going with this, if you if you remember, we have a timeline, and uh, I have a most holy chart, and you can contact me, um, and I can, can send you a most holy chart, and it's just but it's just black and white stuff, and it but it shows us that clearly from the time that Abraham made a treaty with the Philistines, or Palestinians. This is kind of on everybody's mind now. He made a treaty gave, giving them legal right to be in the land. 1,100 years later, Samson is betrayed to the Philistines for 1,100 shekels of Philistine silver. That's pretty wild. But it's just a black and white thing that's in the Bible. If you just literally believe the Bible and the numbers and stuff. Um, Isaac is born when Abraham is 100 years old. When Isaac is 60, Jacob is born. And Jacob, when he's 130 years old, enters Egypt. They're in Egypt 430 years to the very day. Then they're in the desert for 40 years, and the book of Joshua is exactly 30 years old. And if you just add up the numbers in the book of Judges, it's 410. And Samson's the last judge at the 410 years. Add all that up, and guess what? It's 1,100. 1,100 years, and bingo. I mean, I asked the Lord for 20 years. If you want some of these things, you got to be a seeker and a persistent seeker. But I asked him for 20 years. Why is this 1,100 shekels here for Samson? There's got to be a reason. There's got to be a reason. And one day, bingo. You know, I'm looking at this most holy scroll, and there it is. Because I'd known for a long time that Abraham was out of the will of God, giving his wife away. Ooh. Ooh. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Wow. Mm, something just hit me. Uh, in my own life, particularly about a land and a wife and a covenant with both. Woo. Okay. So, um, yeah, he was... He was in the flesh, completely in the flesh, by giving his wife away once, and uh, she was literally given away then, and he got money for it. So he tried to give her away a second time to the king of the Philistines. He took her into his home. He never touched her, but that was only by God's doing. But then... Um, Immediately after Isaac is born, Abraham makes a covenant with the Philistines. So, but let's <laughs> give them right to be in the land. Oh my goodness. Y'all have to pardon me because something just hit me pretty hard here. Um, I just got to stop. Lord, I am so grateful to you for talking to me. In your sovereignty and your in your prophetic gift, both show me what you're doing and what you have already done. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Mm. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Hebrew Greek Keyword Study Bible, NIV, tells me so. <laughs> that was supposed to be funny. For the Most Holy Bible tells me so. 
Okay. Now, if you want to, that we'll work through this because this is not going to. It's a sin for a teacher to presume that students already know what he already knows. And I'm trying not to commit that sin. But in Genesis 17, I'll repeat some of the things I've already mentioned, but we'll go through here sequentially. And um, in chapter 17, in verse 17, is where God's told Abraham that, that he's going to have a, a son. He'd already had one through Hagar. He was uh, 13 years old at that point in time. But he says, you're going to have a son through Sarah. Well, he knows a little about biology, and he knows about his own biology. He knows about his wife's biology. And in verse 17, it says he fell face down and laughed. So that's the first time you see this Yitzchak word. Law of first reference is important. Do a, do us, uh, do, you do well to uh, pay attention to the first time a word is used in Scripture. In chapter 18, as I mentioned, um, it's the Lord Jesus. It says the Yahweh or a messenger of Yahweh repeatedly for this person, accompanied by two angels, that shows up and has lunch with Abraham. Grass-fed beef, may I, may I mention? Grass-fed beef and cottage cheese and and um, tortillas. That's the way it reads to me. So I guess that'd be a taco, you know, tortilla. Anyway, um, they uh, they ate, and then the Lord Jesus starts talking about they're going to have a baby, and Sarah starts laughing and then denying. He says, "Why'd she laugh?" And anyway, that's here in chapter eighteen. That's here in chapter 18. Um, like I say, this word, it's shock, is used, I mean, this word, shahak, it's shock is Isaac. Shahak is used 13 times in the Bible. There's six of them there. One of them is over here in chapter 17. It's kind of, it's due to meditate on, to think about this heterosexual relations is, are really, really beautiful. It's God's idea. It's a it's a Garden of Eden thing. And this is a man and woman who've been married for decades. They have not been able to conceive. They are heterosexual. They have not been able to conceive. They've gone through a lot of tests. But then, you know, that in, in their agedness, they're no longer would seem the implication of what Sarah and Abram say or Abraham say is that they're probably not any longer sexually active. But then all of a sudden, you know, this beauty of the beauty of marital relations is, 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 is amazing. And you think about God gave that back to them at age 90 and age a hundred. They're having a child. Their bodies are restored. She's actually having a baby and nursing a baby specifically mentions that. Um, and, and in this glory and beauty of this wonderful heterosexual thing and the, the fruit of, of children, which only comes obviously from heterosexual sex, is followed by this horrible chapter about Sodom and Gomorrah. And the word shahak, which is, again, is rare in the Bible, is mentioned in that chapter. It's not just random that that this homosexual horror of uh, they're, they're attempting to rape angels in this, this story. Lot tries to get his future sons-in-law to get out of Dodge with him, to leave Sodom with him because they're going to, you know, God's going to burn this place to a crisp. And it says they thought he was joking. They thought he was laughing. They thought he was making fun. They thought he was mocking. And the word is sahak. So these boys were very likely corrupted. It seems that every male in the, it says every male in the city gathered around the door to try to rape these angels. I'd say they were at least bisexual. And they're mocking 
or they think Lot's mocking. Because in a sense, everybody, hmm, everybody in the city is kind of a bunch of, instead of a bunch of jerks, they're a bunch of twerks. Okay. So moving right along in chapter 20, they've received this promise of rejuvenation and Abraham is all of a sudden got a, a wife that looks like she's 25 or 30 and Abimelech, I believe, probably didn't even know it was really Sarah because the last time he saw Sarah, but I didn't know what she looked like. And so he didn't know what was going on here. It says, hey, God, I didn't know what was going on. He said she's my sister, and so he probably thought she was his sister. But all the fault belongs to Abraham saying she's my sister, and God corrects Abimelech, and Abimelech corrects Abraham and says, why did you do this? And he says, I was afraid. The father of faith is walking in this kind of fear after receiving the blessing of rejuvenation, he's been rejuvenated. His wife has been rejuvenated. And the scripture says that the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles. I believe among the Philistines, the Bimelech is the king of the Philistines because of you. In other words, God, God's name didn't look very good here because he's, this is the first time, first time the word prophet is used in the Bible. And God corrects Abimelech and says, Abraham is my prophet. Don't touch his wife. We don't look very good. The people of God don't look very good right there. In any case, we see what kind of courage at this point Abraham was not walking in. So that's kind of a history there that if you can really let yourself meditate on it, you know, their promised rejuvenation, new sexual relations, uh, new fertility. And then we see this ugly homosexual chapter. And then chapter 20, the, there's an obvious manifestation of rejuvenation. And then in chapter 21, Isaac is born. Because the Lord had said this time next year, there's going to be a son. You're going to have a child. So this is all within a year there. Chapter 18, 19, and 20. And she has, they have this baby. They name him Isaac. And Sarah says, verse 6, Sarah said, God has brought me laughter. And everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. As that's a hawk word. And she added, who would have said that to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have born him a son in his old age. This Sahak thing here is prominent here. It's a central thing. When she says, the Lord has made me to laugh, well, he made her laugh the first time when she was laughing in unbelief. And he says, why'd you laugh? Oh, I didn't laugh. Anyway, they, they've done what, what was wrong, but it's like God's got a good sense of humor with this and, and shows them a lot of grace. It's a neat thing. It's a beautiful thing, but yet at the same time, it wasn't their finest hour when they were both laughing at God at the very thought of their rejuvenation. So here's this Sahak thing. And then um, at the last part of chapter 21, there's kind of an epilogue there, is the treaty at Beersheba. Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, who has had Sarah in his house and gave her back, and now Sarah's conceived and born a son to Abraham. So he, he thoroughly knows that these two people have gone from looking like they were 90 and 100 to looking like uh, a young couple. Uh, they newlyweds almost, okay? And a miracle of miracles, I think that would impress a man who saw what had happened as much as the parting of the Red Sea because we all live with this aging thing, and we all aging is the ultimate disease. We all see that, and if God can roll that back and turn that back, and he has, I believe, in a couple of places in the Bible, 
then that's impressive to this Abimelech guy. I mean, we already know that Abraham is afraid of Abimelech. He's the king of the Philistines and they rule the land. And he's a visitor there. And this Philistine king of Amalek shows up and says, make a covenant, okay? Uh, verse 23. Okay, verse 22 of chapter 21. At that time, Abimelech and Phil called the commander of his forces, said to Abraham, God is with you in everything you do. Yes. If we could really read the Hebrew right there. It would probably be some hints there about what's happened. He's with you in everything you do. Now swear to me here before God that you will not deal falsely. You, you, not your children, not your descendants. You will not deal falsely with me or my children or my descendants. I think that's obvious. He thinks Abraham's going to live forever. <laughs> he thinks that this hundred-year-old man that looks like he's 30 and he used to look like he was a hundred that he's going to be around when his children and their, their children, their descendants are around. He's not talking about, it. he's not saying your descendants be, you know, make a covenant for your descendants to be good to my descendants. He says, you, it's pretty awesome. Read between the lines here that you will not deal falsely with me or my children or my descendants and show to me, in the country where you are living as an alien, the same uh, kindness is the word. It's actually said, faithful love, that I've shown to you. And he swore it, and they made this covenant. And you've heard me teach this probably if you've heard a lot of my teachings. He makes a covenant, and when he makes a covenant, he plants a he plants a tamarisk tree. The first time the word tamarisk tree is used in the Bible, it's only used three times in the Bible. But here's the first time, and it says he plants a tamarisk tree, kind of memorializing this thing with, with Abimelech, the king of the Philistines. And I don't believe that he knew what he was doing prophetically, but the word of God is written for us upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And the tamarisk tree is a picture of poverty. The Philistines are people of poverty. The Palestinians are people of extreme poverty. They can take prosperity and turn it into poverty right quick. You can see it today. Isn't it amazing that the Edomites are gone, the Ammonites are gone, the Hittites are gone? All the other ites are gone, but the Philistines are still there. Why? Because the apostle from God, Abraham, had the right to the land, and he gave them right to share it with them and so here we are four thousand years later still struggling with this palestinian thing think about that okay so this timorous tree is a tree that's unique in that it pulls salt out of the ground puts the salt in the leaves drops the salty leaves on the ground which kills the vegetation around the tree which and then there's other tamarisk trees, and basically they create a desert. It's desertification, it's slow progress there. Same way with the Philistines. The other two times the tamarisk tree is mentioned is about in um, 1 Samuel 20 and 1 Samuel 31. Um, and it's about, really, about the spirit of the Philistines upon Saul that ultimately kills. Saul and Jonathan, and they were buried under a tamarisk tree. I can't really go into that in detail. That's on several of our, my recorded teachings. But there's three dramatic mention, mentions of this tamarisk tree. So anyway, I mention that because what we're talking about here is this curse that begins right here. The Philistines have legal right in the land. Oh, Jesus. Uh, anyway, goodness, that was an amazing insight a while ago. Anyway, so for whatever reason, okay, here's Abraham, and he's kind of a, a, a 2,000 years after Adam, okay? David is 3,000 years after Adam, but Samson is right before David. 
Samson's the last judge. And then you got Saul and David showing up. So this is about a thousand years right here from Abraham to Samson. And as I said, if you start all the way back with the, the Beersheba covenant, when Isaac is born, it's exactly 1,100 years to right here when, where Samson is, is where he uh, finishes out his days, where he dies. And that's what I accidentally turned to this morning. Uh, turn with me to chapter 16 of Judges, and we'll wrap up with this insight. And uh, I'll show you this, and I believe you'll agree that there is a, a word here because of two things, because of the 1,100 years and the 1,100 shekels, this connection. And, you know, I, don't, I hope I don't say this in any pride, but as far as I know, I'm the only one teaching this about the 1,100 years and 1,100 shekels, but it's, it is an objective fact. It's a matter of simple addition, addition reading what's black, black and white. But I think it's uh, very important. Um, you all remember that, that he gets betrayed by Delilah for the 1,100 shekels. And um, let's pick up in verse 20, 1620. Then she called Samson. This is Delilah. The Philistines are upon you. And he awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. How sad. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with the bronze shackles, they set him to grinding in the prison. But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder if there's a connection here. We're talking about the Beersheba covenant and 1,100 years later, the death of Samson, the betrayal of Samson. And so the Beersheba Covenant is when Isaac is born and Isaac winds up blind. He winds up blind. And Samson is blind. I wonder if there's an echo there. So now the rulers of the Philistines, verse 23, assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon their God and to celebrate, saying, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their God, okay? Think about the Palestinians kidnapping those people, those hundred and something people on October the 7th, 2023. They captured them. They carried some of their dead bodies, but they captured live prisoners. And they're, when they did, and they went to the streets of Gaza, This is in Gaza. They went through the streets of Gaza and the people cheered and praised their God, Allah. Samson is taken captive and tortured. Many of them were. Back up again, verse 21. The, when the Philistines seized him, they gouged out his eyes and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding in the prison, but the hair on his head began to grow after it had been shaved. Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer great sacrifice to Dagon their God and to celebrate, saying, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, just like the Palestinians did the other day, Our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste our land and multiplied our slain. Hmm, don't that sound familiar? And while they were in high spirits, they shouted, bring Samson to entertain us. And they called. So they called Samson out of the prison and he sahak for them. He performed for them is what the NIV says. The word is sahak. It's like he entertained them. Some have said that there was something sexual about this. That there was possibly uh, some kind of a rape thing going on. Because doing a word study, you see the Sahak mentioned. There was a Sahak I didn't mention with Isaac, 
Isaac, whose name is Yitzhak, and his mother says, the Lord has caused me to shahak and to laugh. You know, he didn't see his daddy give his mama to Abimelech. But, you know, Abimelech, by the way, is an inherited name of the kings of the Philistines, like Caesar is an inherited title. Or So Isaac does the same thing about his wife and says, she's my sister. Now, she was not. Rebecca was not in the harem of Abimelech at that point in time, but she was subject to be taken by some Philistine and someone looked down from a, a balcony or something and they saw Isaac sahawking with his wife, Rebecca. And they said, dude, we saw you sahawking with your wife. They were frolicking some way in a man-woman way. So Yitzhak was shahaking with his wife. So there's a there could be an implication here of maybe some kind of rape. It's a very broad word. But they caught they called Samson out of the prison and he shahaked for them. Now, I've I've left you with as many questions probably as I have answers. But there's there's a connection. There's a connection with shahaks to shahak. Good shahak, bad shahak. By the way, halfway between Abraham and Isaac and Samson is Mount Sinai. Moses goes up on the mountain for 40 days. Like I said, there's only 13 times shahak is mentioned in the Bible. And one of them is when he's up there for 40 days and comes down he finds the people indulging in revelry, is what he says. But the word is shock. Same word. It's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. It's when Abra, it's when Moses broke the tablets. So anyway, you, you're what God is to me will be who he is to those that I teach. I hope that this is a blessing and you get to see, I spent most of the day uh, looking into this to at least after lunch. And I believe that there's something here and with it, what's going on politically in the world right now, I think it's interesting that this came up as I thumbed through my Bible today. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the special thing you showed me in the middle of this teaching for me personally. I am grateful. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.